Hey, so uh, I'm James. Uh, I'm a security researcher at Red Balloon Security. And I should mention, when I, when I was doing this research, I, I was working at NCC Group, and they were nice enough to let me still present it after I quit. But, uh, so the, I'm going to be talking about hacking Amiibo. And if you're not, not familiar with Amiibo, there are these toys with, for uh, Nintendo consoles. And, and what you do is you, you take the toy, you get some toy, and you can put it on the console in so, some place. And it interacts with the game. So like in one of the first games to, to really make much, a big use of this was the Super Smash Brothers game. And like you would get some character. And then you, when you use the toy in the game, you, you get that character as like an AI, and you can save, uh, you could train it and save items to it. Um, so, so the, these devices actually, you can read and write data to them and, and, and save, uh, so that each game can save its own data onto the Amiibo. And the way that that works is that they, they use NFC. Um, so in the in the bottom of the tag, there's something. It's kind of like an RFID. There, there's an NFC tag, which is um, NFC is, is a way to do contactless data and power transfer, and what basically the all it is is there's big uh, well, it's small but there's an antenna and then a very tiny integrated circuit that gets powered uh, by the radio and and also can um, you know there's actually it can do logic and and yeah uh, okay so. Uh, also, around the time when I started doing this, I was, I was really into um, save game hacks. And one example back on the Wii was for the Twilight Princess game. Um, one of like the only two string inputs in the game uh, was vulnerable to buffer overflow, and that was when you, when you could name your horse. Uh, so they edited the save file and you know, did a, a basic stack overflow. Um, and using that, they were able to do a, a software-only Kind of jailbreak on the on the console and install new apps onto it, and the, um, so so this is what it looked like. You they just have this file. You load it up. Uh, you walk up to some character, and as soon as you talk to them, um, the buffer overflow triggers, and they you know run their own program and install their own their own channel on the Wii. So the the reason that you do this is that modern consoles, uh, or the the past few generations of consoles, they they are kind of like kind of like uh, smartphones in a way where they're, they, they kind of lock you out from having total control of the device. Um, so people that want to, say if you wanted to run your own uh, homebrew games or you want to run Linux on a console or something, that you wouldn't really be able to do it without breaking the security model of the console. And they've been getting very complex and very interesting. So that there's a diagram here of, of the, uh, the 3DS, which took about like four, four or five years to, to break because it, there, and you can see there's so many steps and there, there's all this encryption and signing. Um, so part of the reason you want to find an exploit is, is you can use that exploit, you can leverage that exploit to jailbreak the console. Um, so uh, I also started this before the Switch uh, was coming out. So there's only the Wii U and the 3DS, but we knew that the Switch was going to come out and is also going to be supporting Amiibo. Uh, so basically anything that I would work for, um, so if I'm hacking these and I can do something on the 3DS or the Wii U, it's also going to work on the Switch when that comes out. And it'd be interesting to see like these new games on the Switch that are going to you know, save all this Amiibo data on them if I could, if I could maybe find an exploit on the Switch doing, doing that. And like, it's not the most practical uh, attack, but it would it'd be like a very hilarious thing to do to find some, some attack where you use an, an Amiibo to, to exploit the Switch. So the... Uh, um, so the the questions are like how how easy would it be how easy is it to clone the amiibo or spoof them uh, could the data on them could we use that for some kind of save game exploit and finally uh, you know for especially could it be used for an exploit on the switch Th those were the uh, the questions I had in mind when I started doing this um, so to get started. Uh, the first thing that I'd want to do is see what the data on the Amiibo is like. And if you, were, if you actually get a, a scan or a dump of, of the NFC tag, it's mostly, it looks like this, and it's mostly indecipherable bytes. Uh, and mostly, it's mostly encrypted. So it turns out part of this is actually uh, in plain text. So if we go, go through the different um, parts of it, some of the things that you can see are that the serial number is right at the beginning, and that's, that's in plain text. Um, there's actually a character ID that's also in plain text that's a few bytes long. Um, 
But the biggest chunk of it down at the bottom is all encrypted data. And then some of the other stuff in there, besides some settings, uh, there's signatures and hashes for, for the encrypted data. So almost all of it is uh, protected by encryption and, and signing, um, which means you can't, you can't tamper with it because uh, you're not going to be able to make a, a valid signature. Um, so the first, the first part, if I want to actually edit, edit these and mess around with them, I'm going to have to figure out the, how the crypto works. Uh, so well, to start off with, and at least know that they're encrypted, and also that each, each one is, has a unique encryption keys, so that it's not like you can't use the same keys for every, every single one of them. Um, also, due to the way they're signed, you can't, you can't just copy, you can't directly copy data from one amiibo to another. The kind of the signatures actually involve the serial number of the amiibo, so, um, and it's going to be very difficult, very difficult to, to do anything with them until you can break the, the crypto. So one, one person I've actually already figured this out, um, and they released this tool called, called the Meet Tool, and this, this would actually go through the, it would do the decryption and encryption algorithm, but you need the keys to do that. And one thing that they would not do is release the keys because they don't want to get in too much trouble. Um, and they also don't want to, they don't want to really aid people in piracy. So if you want the keys, you're going to have to find them yourself. Um, and the other, the alternative alternatives to, to just have, having the keys to use with the meet tool, uh, I think the same person also made an online API that you could use if, if you get an API key from them and like you could send your Amiibo data to their server and it would do the uh, crypto uh, for you. Um, the issue with this is be, I'd, I would be limited to, like, I, so there would be kind of a rate limiting or you know, if the service goes down or if they don't like what I'm using it for, I, I wouldn't really be, um, you know, I'd be restricted by that. And there's also these uh, little cheat devices. So if you just wanted to like copy your edit amiibo, there's some, you can get these at GameStop and uh, they kind of do the same thing where they, you, it has to be connected to your PC and it has to be online and they're just gonna send your amiibo data to their server and then do the encryption or decryption there and also the, the, the editing there and send it back to you. Um, so they're also, you know, you can't just use this to do whatever you want either. Uh, they, they're not really trying to help, help, like help, help you get the keys to do this yourself. They just want you to buy their, their tools. Um, so uh, the next, next part, so the, yeah, the first part is to do, to do anything really, I'm gonna have to find the, the crypto keys and to use with the me tool. Um, next is like w w when I have that and I can edit the data, uh, how am I gonna actually simulate, so kind of send whatever Amiibo data I want to the console or like simulate them um, and the answer because it's a because it's an NFC device, one of the main tools for for doing NFC or RFID research is called the Proxmark Three, and it's this software-defined radio uh, tool. It's all the code for it is open source, and you can you can reprogram it. So if I wanted to, to if I needed to add new behavior to it, I could do that by writing more code. Um, and the nice the other nice thing is that this could be used. This it can simulate the Amiibo and, and act like an Amiibo to the console. It, all, it could also simulate the console and act like a console to the Amiibo. So for any, any steps that I want to mess around with, I'd be able to do that with the software-defined radio. Um, so uh, just to go over like what, what the NFC tag is again, there's basically a, a, a digital control unit. So this is like, what takes in commands and will send out the responses, and then you have a little bit of a EEPROM storage, um, and then RF interface just so it can communicate over over the radio. Um, the Proxmark has some has already has some built-in support for like the the basic part of this, where it can um, simulate an NFC tag that wakes up and reports what its serial num its serial number is. But beyond that, it, it's, uh, it doesn't do anything else. Almost all the other code for, on Proxmark is for messing with like uh, proximity ID cards. Um, so to, to simulate the specific kind of tag in an Amiibo, which is called a N tag, um, we'd have, have to write new code to simulate that. Um, and this, uh, this is from the data sheet on N tag. So basically the part on the top that's in green, that's where tag will like wake up and show its ID, but everything in the bottom, 
like reading reading data, writing data. Uh, there's a password authentication. There's um, version and reading signatures. All that stuff would have to would have to write new code to to simulate that on the Proxmark. Uh, so the so to to do to uh, you know get a, a useful tool to actually start tampering with the Amiibo data and like maybe trying to do exploits against games or the console, you'd have to first implement the, the NTAG 215 simulation with the, some software-defined radio, like the Proxmark, um, get the crypto keys to actually be able to change the data, and finally kind of glue them together in a way that you have like a useful tool where you can tamper with the data, uh, send it out to the console, and get, get some feedback, um, and come up with some way to, to use that to like do uh, kind of fuzz testing. Um, so first, the first part I looked at was actually getting the crypto keys. So, uh, I, uh, like I said before, the some of the people that already figured this out don't didn't want to release the keys. Um, but luckily, the 3DS was already jailbroken at this point, and by jail, getting a jailbroken 3DS, um, it would be much easier to go through the process of just reverse engineering the NFC service code on, on that. On that device myself, because uh, you know the, the here's the work that the other people put in the jailbreak. It was already done. That was like the hardest part. Um, so at that point, I can just dump out the NFC service uh, binaries and start like trying to find. Can I find the crypto keys in here? Um, and also, I can kind of tamper with those processes while they're running on the device. Uh, so there's this cool custom firmware for the 3DS that I that I used. Uh, it's called NTR, and one of the nice, one of the cool things that it would do is add a debugger onto the 3DS. But sadly, uh, the for the version of 3, 3DS that I had, at least um, breakpoints in the debugger didn't work, which means I can't just like step through the code and kind of watch what's happening as it's going. Really, all I could do is read and write memory out of out of the different uh, processes on the 3DS. So this is. This is what the interface for it looks like. So you you connect to the debugger. Um, you could list out processes, and then you can also read and write from memory. And ideally, you, there's this debugging feature <clears throat> that you could turn on. But as soon as soon as then I turned on the uh, as soon as I attached to a process to try to debug it, it would just crash the 3ds. So I was limited, kind of limited in what I could do with that. Um, but one of the things that I can do just by dumping memory is is a uh, See if I dump out. So, well, for one, dump out the service and see like what's inside it. Uh, but two, um, if I use some program that actually will read an amiibo and and do something with it, then and you know cause the NFC service to decrypt it, and then I dump the memory out immediately afterwards, I might be able to to recover the decrypted uh, images that way. Um, and that that was one of the first. So one of the first things I did was I set up a little a custom app that would turn on the NFC service. Um, it would scan, it would wait for the amiibo to show up, and as soon as it, it would read it, I would use the dump, the dump memory feature in the debugger, and then I could search through it and try to find uh, my, my decrypted data. So it, you can see here kind of that there's like the plain text nick, nickname um, that I had written, and also like the name of the me that it was set up, set up with. Uh, so you can, so this, with this way, at least, like I can I can start to get the, the decrypted images and see what's inside them. Although it's it's a very um, clunky way to do it. But to go over what what we can see now, uh, so there's the the nickname, the uh, information about the me that it was re registered to. There's the, the the biggest part is the game or application data and the 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 ID for the application. So any any game can save whatever data it wants into this game data section. Um, so whichever, whatever the last game that you played with that did this is, is gonna have its data on there. Um, there's the, ser the serial number again and the character ID and also a signature. And then just more, more signature and settings bits that are kind of less interesting. Um, so w when it came to doing like a reverse engineering the NFC service, um, one of the first things that you kind of t do with any any binary is search for strings uh, that you try to get some context for, for what you're looking at. And immediately, like just doing a, a simple string search, found um, this really weird. 
uh, really suspicious looking strings. One of them said locked secret, and one of, and one said unfixed infos, and like there wasn't really there weren't really many other strings at all in the binary, so this stuck out right away. But I didn't know what it was yet. Um, and there's actually two two sets of the two sets of this like unfixed info, lock secret showing up. Um, and I wanted to figure out like how these how these were used. I had some other issues where I was trying to like I wasn't using IDA. I, I, I tried using Hopper on Linux, and it, it didn't it didn't work too well. Um, but, one of, but one of the issues with looking at the NFC service is the code isn't set up like a typical program where you have the main entry point and it calls into all the other parts of the app. It's, it's a, set up as a, as a service where there's all these little stub functions for the different service calls you can make and like little isolated bits of code. So it, when you identify, like for a typical program, you identify like some main entry point and then the, the disassembler can like kind of trace the path through all the code and like keep identifying more stuff for you automatically. But this way, I had to like manually go in and see like, did this look? Does this look like a, you know, a function prolog in hex? And then like hit the code analysis thing and turn it into code. And so it was very um, bad, like slow, slow process to work with in the doing the static analysis. Um, it also crashed a lot. So uh, so I have like a broken debugger and like all this hard to identify code and my disassembler, I can't search without crashing half the time. So what, what can I do in this situation? So what I decided, or what I ended up doing um, was using, using the, the custom application that, and the, the, the homebrew libraries that already existed, what I would try to do is, is leverage them to um, call into certain parts of code and then identify where that code was in the binary. Um, so there was this code. Th there's these error codes that would show up a lot, and if you called a certain function like like open app data or scan tag or whatever, and you called it at the wrong time, you would you get this invalid state error code, and it shows up like kind of all over the place. Um, it's and it's this nice like unique looking 32-bit value instead of just being like a one or a two. Um, and what what I it did was I would find I could search for that error code throughout the binary, and the the, fir the first thing I did was I'll just replace that code with with like hex dead beef, and then start calling random functions. And when I see the dead beef show up, I kind of know like that I called into that piece of code in the binary that I had changed. Um, the and th this is where I had like added more features into the app so I could call all these different all these different uh, service calls and kind of do them all at the wrong time and try to do it when they when I would be in the invalid state. Um, the second iteration of that was instead of instead of like putting dead beef, I would put the actual address in the binary that I had been that I had replaced. So when I see an error code that shows up that's not the original error code, it's actually giving me the address to look at in the binary um, to see like what what I had called into. And then I could just start pressing more buttons, like doing things at the wrong time. Um, and if it was in the invalid state, it would it would return an error, and the error would tell me where to look in the binary to, to find that code. Uh, and the, the the last and like the so the last iteration I did of this, and the the part of, like the best way to use this um, is instead of just replacing the invalid state error codes, I would take a list of all the different functions where where I might want to. Um, where I wanted to see where they were, uh, I would rewrite the beginning of the function so that it would immediately just return its own address as an error code. And then now when I call stuff, even if it's like not in, in the invalid state, it, it doesn't matter when I call it, it will immediately just give me back an error code uh, telling me what the address is. So like if I call the open app data, I immediately get an error code and it gives me the, the address of open app data in the binary, which will help me reverse engineer that and like it gives me the context I need to understand what's happening within that in that assembly um, and this is a so this is a video of the app okay well 
that's what I get for not doing a live presentation there. Or a demo, I mean. <laughs> okay, uh, but okay, all that all that happens is I rewrite the function prologs, and then I like you see here, the get amiibo settings um, is instead of returning the invalid state error code, it's returning its address. I go into into Hopper, and I go to that address, and I have identified where that function was in the binary. So it's now I can much more quickly you know, find my way through through the NFC service. Um, and start to like focus in on, on trying to find where the cryptography fun functions are in the binary. Um, so then, what I, I start to eventually, you know, from, from there, I actually start to find there's uh, some function that reads the weird unfixed info lock secret str strings that I had seen before. Um, and it does, if you remember, there, there were two sets, there were like two copies of that. So there's, when it, when it reads these values, uh, there's actually a conditional. Um, st statement that chooses which which set to read, and it reads it reads some weird bit in from memory to make this decision. So I looked up uh, w what this bit means, and it's actually something that's set by the kernel, and it and it's it's, it's uh, some conf configuration settings that that are set by the kernel. And there's this bit in here that tells you whether the console is a is a developer unit or a retail unit. So at this point, I know it's like I already, I already knew there's different sets of encryption keys for retail consoles and, also, and the developer consoles. So at this point, I was pretty certain that this unfixed info lock secret stuff was, was the uh, keys needed to do uh, the encryption for the Amiibo. Um, and then you know, I, found, I found another thing that was, you know, if you look up the algorithm for doing HMAC, this, this this function matched exactly, like you could tell it was doing an HMAC, and also um, by tracing what the input what to it was, I could see part of that unfixed info blob was being used as a HMAC key, and I could so at, at this point I can kind of see like how different parts of of that uh, crypto information is being used, um, but and also I can start to see kind of where like. There's stuff in the binary that looks exactly what's what uh, looks exactly what the me tool program does, um, but I just wanted I wanted to get the keys as quickly as possible. So so now knowing knowing that I had at least part of it, I kind of I started searching for like the parts that I had online, and actually found you know, by by searching for them in a certain format, I found uh, I found the the whole file that was needed for a me tool. Um, and then I could do the you know I could do the encryption and decryption then, which is nice. But I, I looked at what was inside this file, in, inside the the key file, and there was stuff in there that I but did not appear at all in the NFC service binary or anything else that I looked at. And um, I wanted to know where where it actually came from, the, you know, so I could understand what the, how the the whole system was working. Um, so what the big piece that hasn't shown up at all yet in this is the 3DS had, had this complicated AES encryption dedicated hardware that, that was explained in a, like a really good talk called Breaking the 3DS at CCC. Um, and what happens is there, there's these two different key components that get sent into this hardware AES engine and then they are scrambled to generate a new key and that new key can never leave the AES chip uh, the only way to use it is you, you tell you tell this chip what you want to encrypt, um, and it will do that for you. But you can never access like what what the real key is being used inside there. Um, so the at the at the breaking the 3DS talk, they figured out what that that algorithm was to generate the composite key. But before uh, that had that had happened, before they broke that, um, the way the way that the way that this, what this engine would do, um, it was using AES in something called counter mode. And with counter mode, you have some initial counter value and, and, and uh, nonce. Uh, and it uses the AES block cipher to encrypt, it encrypts the counter and generates a, like a block of kind of pseudo random data. Um, and it keeps increasing the counter and making a new block, block by block. And then once you have, a, you know, enough blocks to cover whatever your input is, it will do XOR encryption with the blocks against your 
say, your plain text, um, and then you get the ciphertext. So an important so an important part of the XOR operation is if you, you XOR something with zero, you just get the same value back. Uh, so if you were to t tell this AES engine to just to encrypt all zeros, what you're going to get back is the the intermediate um, key stream, and using that you can which is kind of it's re they refer to it as a XOR pad. Um, using that, you can actually do the offline encryption and decryption without needing the the, three, the AES hardware. Um, and this turns out uh, turns out that this was the, the that weird value that was in the key file that I couldn't find before. Um, and to, to verify that, I just kind of set up like a Python script to take different values from um, the info I had and try to do AES in counter mode. Uh, and it turned out uh, using like the using the AES parameters from the NFC service binary and using the some NFC key info from the from the 3DS and you you encrypt I just encrypted a bunch of zeros and I got something that matched this uh, this weird 32 byte value that was that was in the uh, me, uh, me tool key file. Um, so now like now you know. Putting all those parts together, you can start to actually explain what what the entire system is. So, um, on the NFC tag or on the data on the tag, there's there's two partitions to the to the data that's on there. There's the the ta the locked secret part is um, the tag information, which is like the serial number, the character ID, and then a, a just a kind of unique 32 byte value that's uh, unique to each amiibo. And then the other section, uh, it's called unfixed infos, is, is the data, it has like settings, um, it has the game data and the registered me data. Those are all in the data section. And for each section, what happens is, is they generate two, two sets of the AES parameters and, the, and HMAC keys. Uh, and then for each, each partition, it, the, the HMAC key that was generated for it, they sign that partition. Uh, in the case of the data section, they encrypt it with the AES. Um, the tag section doesn't get encrypted. That, that remains in plain text. And then finally, they kind of rearrange that whole buffer to the format it needs to be on the NFC tag. Uh, so to reverse that, they just they you know rearrange the buffer again, um, generate the keys, decrypt the data, and then check all that all the HMAC signatures are valid. Uh, so the most the the most complicated part of this is actually doing the generating the AES parameters and generating the, the HMAC keys. Uh, so the way that they do this, um, they have they use a, a deterministic random bit generator, generator, and the the seed for the random bit generator is going to take the the type string, which is the name of the partition. Um, so that would be what the, the locked secret or unfixed info string is, that's the type string. Then they take some magic bytes that go with that partition. And in the case of uh, the data partition, <clears throat> excuse me, they also include the write counter, which is the number of times that that tag has been updated. Um, then they put in the serial number of the tag. And finally, the encrypted, uh, the encrypted 32 byte value, which came from the unique 32 bytes in the in the tag section getting encrypted through the AES hardware engine and like putting all that stuff together that's the seed for uh, a random bit generator and what that bit generator what the bit generator outputs is 48 bytes that are going to be a new AES key uh, count, uh, AES counter mode parameters and another HMAC key so th these are this Output is the the unique keys used on the Amiibo, and also um, in the case of the data section, because the write counter is part of the is part of the seed. Every time you update data on the Amiibo, the, there's a new set of keys that are going to be generated. So it's not it's not just unique to Amiibo. It's it's each Amiibo. It's it's un the keys are unique to it in its current state. So every like the keys keep changing every time every time you update it. Um, so. That, that's that's the crypto system. Uh, so the next part 
you know, having that now, now I can like edit, put whatever data I want in the Amiibo and, and try out, out in the game. But you know, to do it in a convenient way, I have to set up the, the Proxmark simulator. Um, so the process behind this was basically the, the Proxmark can sniff traffic. So one thing I would do is put the Proxmark between an Amiibo and the console and record all the traffic. Uh, and even though Proxmark doesn't support simulating every, all these things, it, it is pretty good at actually identifying what the different commands are that it's seeing. Um, and also I can use the data sheet for the end tag to an X to, to also help like identify what, what traffic I'm seeing there. And then I can go through the whole, the whole process um, of like how the console will read from the Amiibo and kind of build that up in, this, in the simulator. So the, to go over again, the, the stuff that I need to implement for the NTAG simulation is I'm gonna have to implement like the read commands, uh, the write command, there's something called conversion, there's a password authentication and uh, read signature commands. And then finally, in addition to just uh, interpreting the commands, I, I also have to set up some piece of memory uh, on the Proxmark itself where I can store the, the, the data that would be on the NFC tag, um, which is not something that was like already set up in the code yet. Uh, and there's no developer documentation for, for developing on Proxmark, so you just kind of have to read through it and like figure out where everything is and figure out how it works yourself and then uh, where to add stuff. Uh, so what I ha had originally, what I'd like to do is like make a new you know, generic NTAG simulator thing that would be nice and modular, but I ended up just kind of sticking this into the part of the code that already simulated like waking up and uh, reporting the serial number. Um, the Amiibo, the Amiibo. Um, so this, uh, so this is like, this is what uh, the read operation looks like. So it's almost, it's pretty much the same. The console will go through the same series of steps every time it's doing a read or every time it's, it's doing writing. So I take, this is what a typical read looks like. Uh, the, it wakes up the Amiibo, it reads out some settings, and then it will actually start to uh, read all of the box of memory from the storage. Um, so the first, and I would you know, go down this list and basically implement the commands one by one. So the first one is called the get version. And all that does is get, uh, you know, for each version of NTAG, it has its own like version bytes. And all you have to do is send back the exact uh, bytes that mean NTAG215. Um, but one of the, like, the first two uh, issues I ran into with doing this, even, even though it's, these are very simple commands, um, every, everything that you send has to have a checksum value sent with it. Um, so in this case, You'll have to calculate the CRC 16 checksum on the data you're going to send back. But also, you, you have a time limit. So there, there's this um, the specification for NTAG says, like, for most of these commands, uh, you only have five milliseconds to respond. Uh, so including, like, getting the command, interpreting it, and, like, making a response, and then doing a checksum and sending it back. You, only, you, have, you have to do it in less than five milliseconds where it's going to reset and it's not going to work. Um, so that's kind of why you need the specialized hardware, like a Proxmark, to do this, um, where they have you know very fast, dedicated hardware to to handle all this. Uh, but I had what I had to do is for these kind of initial commands is add them to a cache, where I kind of pre-calculated all the checksums, and then when I would get the command, I could I could send the cached response back, and then I, I wouldn't time out right at the beginning. Um, the next part to do, uh, there was this read command, and the read command is just going to read um, 16 bytes of data from a certain location. Uh, and this is where I have to start actually implementing the, the, the EEPROM uh, buffer, um, which one of the things that existed in the, in the code for Proxmark was something called big buffer, and it's like this, it's a custom uh, heap implementation. Um, but in, in addition to like allocating, deallocating memory, it has this reserved section on the heap where it, you can put the card, the, the tag data, and it, you can like free everything else but still retain that tag data across your different um, operations. So I took that and I also set it up so I could send, I could send 
data from my laptop to the Proxmark over USB and store it in the buffer and also it also uh, read data back out over USB later. So if I, so I have some Amiibo image, I want to send it in there, I can populate that and it will you know, simulate that and then I want to down, I want to get the state of it back, I can, I can download it back off the, prox, the Proxmark. Um, so the next command is the fast read, which is it can read an arbitrary range of, of uh, the, pa the pages. Pages are just the f four byte blocks of data. Um, and this, so it takes the start position and end position. You return, you calculate the checksum, return all those bytes. Um, the write command will update four bytes at a certain location. Uh, there's the password authentication command. So one of the security features on the, on the NTAG is there, there's the write pages or writing to pages can, can be locked unless you supply a certain password and if you give the wrong password too many times, it permanently locks out the, those uh, pages and you can, never write, you can never write new data to them again after that. So for, for simulating, I don't really care if the console tells me the right password or not, I can just always accept it. Uh, but if I want, you know, I still wanted to know like how, how this worked and like how I could figure out what the correct password was. Um, and one of the nice things I can do with the Proxmark is I can kind of send arbitrary serial numbers um, when, when the console tries to wake up the Amiibo. And I noticed if I just put in all zeros in the serial number, I get this weird, weird password back that's just AA55, AA55. Uh, that's just the alternating pattern of, of zero and one bits. Um, and if I send, if I put like that same, if I start to put the, the same value into my serial number, I get back zeros instead of the, whatever was there originally. So like I put in the AA, the first one gets zeroed out. I put in five five, the, the, the first two bytes of the password are now zero. Um, so this looks like it's XOR again because you XOR the same thing against itself, you get zero. Or if you XOR, you get zero. Against zero, you get the same thing. Um, and so what I did next was if I, instead of sending zeros, I just put this FF byte at different locations in the serial number. Um, and then I take out that, that AA55 mask. You can just see the byte from the serial number is getting copied directly into the password until like the third position where there's actually this shadowing copy of that byte. Um, so then if I mess around and I add more, I set more bytes to FF, I can actually, you know, if I put one, two positions ahead, I get, I zero out the FF that had showed up. If I put one, two positions behind, I zero out the other one. And I can fit, like doing this, I figure out, you, know, you can figure out the algorithm for this pretty easily. So it just goes through this uh, process of XORing different bytes in the serial number. And that's how it's gonna generate these passwords for, for any Amiibo. Um, okay, and then the last part was kind of uh, just integrating the crypto with the simulator. Um, so to do that, Proxmark, the Proxmark client ha actually has a Lua built, built into it, so decided I could set up all my logic for like fuzzing and stuff and handling the Amiibo in, in Lua because that's a lot, it's a lot easier to do, to write than C, and the kind of overall design of it looks like this. Um, so on the client side, I have my the Lua script where you can put your fuzzing logic and also you can call the uh, ME tool to do encryption or decryption for you. And then you send whatever, whatever you wanna simulate, you send it over USB to the simulator that's on the Proxmark firmware. Um, and if you know, like when you wanna get the new state of the simulator, you can, you can read that buffer back out, the EEPROM buffer back out over USB. Um, so that, that's the, that's the uh, simulator is done and it worked, it worked fine on the 3DS, but as soon as the Switch came out and I tried using it on the Switch, um, it didn't really work so well. So um, part, of the, part of the issue was that the antenna, um, you want you want the dimensions of the antenna to be pretty similar to the dimensions of the tag, and on the on the 3DS. So the uh, and the default 
antenna you get with Proxmark is kind of shaped like an ID card. And that happens to be good for the 3DS because the antenna in the 3DS is also kind of shaped like a ID card and it's similar size. But the Switch, there's this little antenna that's like the size of your, your fingertip. Um, so you get a very bad signal trying to use the big ID card sized antenna. Uh, the official guide for like making your own antenna is you, you rip, take a bunch of enamel wire and wrap it around hundreds of times and then manually like unwrap it until it's tuned correctly. Uh, and I didn't want to do that, so I tried to I tried to just buy like these pre-made uh, antennas that were kind of like the right size that looked like this. But uh, I also I didn't have any background in electrical engineering, so I had to find out why that that doesn't work. Uh, you you can't it, the the antenna has to be tuned to the entire circuit, um, and. I'm not going to go too much into it, but an NFC antenna is basically a circuit with an inductor and a capacitor, and they have to be matched up just the right way to have a certain resonant frequency, and you want the resonant frequency to be the frequency you're communicating on, and that's on NFC, that's 13.56 megahertz. So um, because of the capacitor that was on the, you know, the, the, the capacitor they had on the Proxmark was set up, you know, the it was tuned with the antenna it came with. Um, for to use the antenna that I had, I would need different capacitance um, to match that. And I had gone through like, you know, figuring out like how do I get the capacitance to be correct, um, so you can calculate like, you know, using your capacitance and the property of the antenna, figure out what the resonant frequency is, and like I had. Five mega or about six megahertz with that thing that I bought, um, and then to figure out like okay, I can add more capacitors to try to get it into the correct range. Uh, ended up so it's kind of hard to. It turns out the capacitors you use for for high frequency radio, they're very tiny and not like. Uh, I would probably have to make a custom designed circuit board to use those. So back to square one with like taking an enamel wire and manually tuning it. But I did try to like splice in this crappy uh, 10 picofarad capacitor and see if it, which is kind of close to what I needed. Um, and it did sort of work for, with the Amiibo, but it didn't work with the switch. Um, it's also, it's not a capacitor that's designed for, for RF. Uh, so, okay, so the last thing, there was this signature check. Um, another, another feature of these N tags is they have a signature on them that proves NXP semiconductor made them. Um, and it's a elliptic, elliptic curve digital signature. Uh, and the idea, uh, part of the idea is like if you were to either simulate or want, you wanted to like produce your own tag, you wouldn't be able to create a valid serial number <clears throat> and signature unless you had NXP's private key. Um, which means that I can't just because the the newer console actually checks the signature, I can't just use any serial number I want to, unless I know what the the signature is, um, and that's kind of a problem because some games like like the Breath of the Wild, will limit how often you can use a certain amiibo, and they limit it like they'll say you can only use it once per day, uh, and they limit it based on the serial number, and that's bad if I want to try like hundreds of different different uh, inputs, um, so. Because of the signature, it seems like I, I'm not going to be able to just do whatever whatever serial number I wanted. But uh, the, well, then I, then I started to like try to see what can I do to, to mess around with this. Um, so uh, I was I did wonder how how some of those cheat devices like you get at GameStop would do it, and I'm not sure. So I didn't actually look into it too much, but I know that because um, every amiibo you use with them, you're sending all your data to their server. They're, they can collect. Uh, serial numbers and, and, and signatures from you, um, which is not something I'd be able to recreate. Uh, I tried to look for kind of like crypto implementation errors. So the, with this, yeah, oh yeah, sorry. Um, that's, uh, so one of the things that you can screw up with this elliptic curve signature is if there's a, a nonce value that you're only supposed to use once per signature, and if you reuse it, you leak your private key out. So this happened with the PlayStation 3 game signatures. Um, 
I checked if they had done this and put the small set of amoeba that I checked, they, they hadn't reused this, this nonce. Uh, but finally, go, I looked over, you know, actually messing around with the, with the protocol of, of when the console tries to read the amiibo. Um, and this, this is the whole process it's gonna go through. It, it finds, uh, it's, it gets the tags ID, it reads the signature out, and then it's gonna validate the ID of the signature. Um, and finally, it's gonna read out all the data check the, the HMAC sig signatures and make sure that the HMAC signatures are correct. Um, so the problem here is w when they validate the ID with, with the ID signature uh, and then they afterwards they check the HMAC on the data, they never correlate the ID in the data with the ID that they checked at the beginning uh, of this process. So in the, at the start of it, you can give whatever known known serial number and signature you have. Like so, you, if you know just one uh, pair of like a serial number and, and its signature, you send that first. But then, when you actually respond to the read commands, you send data for for any other amoeba with a with a different serial number. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so doing that. Uh, so that, that was the, the way to get around, to get around this. Uh, they did, I reported it to, to them and they finally patched it on version five. Uh, but they said that there was no way to fix it on the Wii U, which I, which I found kind of interesting. Um, but so now finally I can, I can send like arbitrary, you know, whatever data I want to the console. And I'll try to go quickly through, through a, uh, <laughs> yeah, the video is not, oh, okay, let's see. Okay, so this is on the bottom, you can see the, the client um, where I'm running a script to load a, uh, an amiibo image into the Proxmark, and then on the top, you actually see the switch. So, uh, and because, because this antenna isn't great, it takes, it takes a little while sometimes, but then it, it showed up. I, and here I'm going to enter like a nickname and save it. Um, and I would show like loading it up again to show that it, that it saved that that it's like the data is persisting in the simulator. But I kind of want to skip skip ahead um, to. And then I showed showed it on the 3ds in the same session because it's cross compatible. Um, Oh. And finally, I, I use it in the Breath of the Wild game, uh, where using a certain using a certain amiibo that's like harder to buy now, uh, you can get like this horse. Um, yeah. So okay, so that's all right. That's so I don't know if there's any time for questions. One one or two. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, are there any questions? that I would have is um, going in and doing um, the fuzzing after this, did you find anything interesting after that? Oh, right. So... This, so that, that at that point that was like where I stopped up. So so the, the next step is is actually like now I have this working tool and I want to start simulating the data. The the issue is that the new games on the Switch added a new layer of encryption and onto the game data. So like Splatoon 2, for example, even though I could read all the other parts of the of the amiibo, like all the game data has a new layer of encryption. And what I wanted to do is figure out how that works, but uh that you know couldn't really do that until the switch was was jailbroken 
and you could decrypt the game. Uh, but I think I think the people that actually made some of the first jailbreaks for the Switch have already actually looked at Splatoon 2 and they figured out what that uh, encryption is. So um, I I had kind of moved on like to doing a different project after it, but. Uh, uh, all the all the source code for this. So if you have a Proxmark three, I put all the source code up on GitHub and try to get to show the link. Um, so it's all it's this is all on GitHub and you you know Proxmark's kind of expensive, but if you have it, you can get, like take this code and and try it out yourself. Um, and so, you know now that somebody has figured out the Splatoon two crypto, I think you could try messing around with that. Um, but uh, so, I guess that's it. Thank you.